Here to explain more is Father Thomas Petrie, Dean and Acting President of the Dominican House of Studies. Father Petrie, let's start off, tell us the difference between what the Germans claim is the synodal path and what Pope Francis is asking the bishops to do. Because what the Germans well, are doing synod. is not a real synodal path according to, the Pope, according to Pope Francis, right? That's right. It seems that way. That seems to be the indication that we've been getting from the Holy Father. I think of his 2019 letter to the German Catholics. Uh, synods were initially re gatherings of churches in dioceses or local regions to address, uh, more often than not, historically theological issues and real theological debates. Whereas what seems to be happening in Germany is a more of a Reformation sort of synod or a synodal way that is looking to reform various structures of the church. What the Holy Father has, on the contrary, asked for is for Germans to focus on interior renewal, evangelization, and most importantly, with regard to the synod, uh, not to focus on changing the church or church structures according to modern mentalities. This is something we see Pope Francis preach quite a bit, that uh, simply the changing of structures is not enough to solve our problems or to answer our questions. So let's get into that. The first major document of the synodal path on separation of powers in the church seems to say outright that church doctrine should be subject to a vote by the faithful and that bishops should have term limits. Why is that dangerous? Well, first of all, the faith and the teaching is not simply a matter of democratic vote. It's not simply the matter of a majority. I look back to the fourth century during the Arian crisis when a vast majority of priests and um, lay people didn't even believe that Jesus Christ was God. Perhaps if we had had a vote then, we wouldn't believe what we believe today. Rather, church teaching comes from a theological uh, development, but ultimately based on what God himself has revealed to the apostles in the fullness of what we call the apostolic deposit, which is to say that everything that has been revealed or everything that Christ has revealed is everything that ever will be revealed. And anything that is taught that is not contained, at least seminally, in the apostolic deposit, namely in scripture, in tradition, I would also add as part of tradition, how the church has worshiped and prayed from the beginning is in fact a corruption and not an authentic development. We don't treat the modern world or human experience as another avenue of revelation. Rather, it's our experiences and our lives that have to be configured to revelation, not the other way around, if that makes any sense. It makes perfect sense. And let's get into the apostolic deposit then, the roots of this current controversy about marriage. Where does church teaching on same-sex unions come from? And why can the church not bless these unions, but can bless the individuals? Well, church teaching always comes from faith and reason, from faith primarily, once again, what God has revealed, both in Scripture and tradition. So we know that God has created man and woman, and that marriage is a created reality by God. And in the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ, that created natural reality of marriage is elevated to a sacramental supernatural reality that confers grace and holiness. But we also know it through reason, through simply looking at human nature, not only the complementarity of male and female, but also the necessity of progeny, of having children, and not only having biological children and creating children, but also in raising children. This goes all the way back to the first millennium that children need a father and mother. This was not only a Christian viewpoint, this was a human viewpoint. And so when we look at same-sex unions, we're looking at a union that is not only contrary uh, to the faith, we're also looking at a union that is contrary to nature, and which is why it can't be blessed. I mean, as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith said, the union itself implies a certain contrariety to God's design and is therefore sinful. And while God and while the church certainly does bless individuals, it does not bless sinful activities or anything that is engaged in a sinful activity or leads to a sinful activity. And so this is where the church's teaching comes from, and this is why we can't bless homosexual unions. And so if we know where our church teaching comes from, how do we know when church teaching can be changed? Is this a moment where we're going to see something change? 
Uh, church teaching doesn't change in this sense. It only develops. And so you often, but even that word is often misused in a lot of Catholic media and by a lot of, I'm sorry to say, even some theologians, because uh, the development always has to be a true organic development, which is to say it's a teaching that is found at least seminally in the early church among the apostles, even if it's not written in Scripture. It was a, something that was prayed. You know, the assumption of Mary is a good example. I mean, we all always prayed, even before the dogma was declared, we always prayed that something and celebrated the death of Mary, that she fell asleep, that something different was about happened at her at the end of her time on earth. All of that sort of develops naturally into an articulated dogma that is then defined. Um, it, but any teaching that is, in fact, contrary to what has gone before and can be shown to be explicitly contrary um, is, in fact, a rupture and not an authentic teaching. But the teachings don't change in that sense. They develop, and any teaching that is not a development but is a corruption is, in fact, a false teaching. Quickly, last question. You use the word rupture. These moves by church leaders in Germany, they're reminiscent of similar moves made during the Protestant Reformation. Are we leading into another schism? Uh, when else have we seen something like this? Well, one hopes not. I mean, schisms have happened even since the Protestant Reformation. I think about the Fenite schism in America, um, you know, uh, suggesting in which a group of people believed that salvation outside the church was literal. You know, we had to sort of, they had to be reconciled. Schisms happen all the time or frequently. Um, are we, is Germany leading to schism? I can't say on that. You know, that's really, it seems the Holy Father is doing everything he can to challenge uh, the German Catholics, German bishops, and German the lay faithful to stay true to the universal church. And I'm edified that the president of the German bishops' conference, even though he's leading uh, the synodal path, he has insisted that Germany will always be part of the universal church. That gives me hope that uh, when push comes to shove, there would not be a schism, but this is only by God's grace. It gives us hope for our brothers and sisters in Germany. Thank you, Father Petrie. We'll likely reach out to you again once the last conference of the Sonata Way happens to get your input.